In the 90s, the Bulls became a dynasty. The team went to the final six times and won all six championships. In five of those six seasons, they won 60 plus games. And of course, one of those was the 72 win seasons, which was an NBA record at the time. My immediate thought after watching the Last Dance documentary, literally, the first thing I thought about were the Atlanta Braves. Why the Braves? Because the Braves are called the team of the 90s. From 1991 to 2005, the Braves were, they were one of the most successful teams in baseball. They won their division 14 consecutive times, five pennants, but they only won one World Series championship. And I get that this nickname was given to them because that streak in the regular season, that streak of regular season dominance started in the 90s. Or when people think about the 90s, how do you not think the Chicago Bulls? The Braves were great, but one championship? And I get it if we're strictly going off baseball, I mean, but still, the Yankees won three. But I get it, too. This is a baseball thing. I just can't accept that name after seeing what the Bulls accomplished from 1991 to 1998. But that was my immediate thought. Welcome to the Re Report Podcast, and I thank you for tuning in to hear me out. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, happy late night, wherever, whenever. I just appreciate you for tuning in. So let's get into it. The Last Dance documentary is finally over, and for me, this was the best sports documentary I've ever seen. I didn't get heavily into basketball until 2007, and that was the year I started to follow all that was happening and keeping up with everything that my brain could just store. This wasn't just the season Kobe won MVP, but it was also the season where he requested a trade from the Lakers. And I made mention of this on my uh, Facebook post uh, right after Kobe Bryant passed. But the reason I bring that up about getting into basketball in 2007 is because most of what I seen in this documentary was fresh to me. A lot of stuff I already knew and I didn't need a behind the scene documentary for it, but there was some stuff none of us knew, including people who were closest to the team and covered them. So first episode, they talked about Jordan's rookie season and all the tension with the team and the GM, Jerry Krause. But of course, that was a story throughout the entire series. Uh, second episode, they talked about Scottie Pippen becoming one of the league's best players. So when hearing people talk about this series on shows like First Take, undisputed or any debate show or podcast that they were discussing or recapping the episodes they truly made it feel like this was a pippin doc as well like he was a topic of discussion throughout a lot of this episode two it also talked about jordan getting injured early on into his in this into his second season he came back and played 18 games that season after playing all 82 in his rookie year uh he broke his leg i believe that was the injury and I just tried imagining how it must have felt. You know, first season, he goes from averaging 28 points per game, six assists, six rebounds. He shot 51% from the field. He was an all-star. He was a rookie of the, year, of the year. And it just all came crashing down in his second season. It just felt like all of that just like blew up after he broke his foot. Missed 64 games. The team still made the playoffs and Jordan did play team was swept by the Celtics and in game two of that season that's that was when Jordan dropped 63 points third episode focused on Rodman and his high energy and off the court situations they talked about Jordan's struggles in the late 80s against the Pistons fourth episode talk about Phil Jackson you know he took the job from Doug Collins he and Tex Winter talked about how they implemented the triangle offense and and that right there honestly just launched the Bulls into the dynasty they ended up becoming. Lots of people talk about how Collins could have eventually led the Bulls to the finals, but into a championship, but I, I don't agree. I honestly disagree. I think the system that Doug Collins brought in wasn't beneficial to the team at all from what was showed on the documentary. He was too focused on Michael Jordan 
and Jordan did accomplish a lot under Collins, but all of his, a lot of his accomplishments were individual awards. You know, that was the time he won defensive player of the year. And there's nothing wrong with winning the awards, but I just don't think that Collins could have had the success that Phil ended up having. So when Phil took over, the Bulls lost to the Pistons in seven games in 1990. And the following season, they beat Detroit and they just never looked back from there. I just don't think Collins could have done what Phil did. A lot of people say he could have, but looking at how the team was running before Phil Jackson took over, I don't think they would have ever gotten over the way that they did had Phil not gotten the job. Episode five was, you know, the beginning of it. You know, it was five, the first five minutes talked about, you know, it had Kobe Bryant in there. Uh, I wouldn't say tough to watch, but it's just still hard to wrap your mind around things knowing that Kobe tragically passed away just four short months ago. And just seeing that, seeing him in the documentary, is it just makes you, it just feels like, man, it really wasn't his time to go. It felt like he's still alive, like he's still here. But it was cool being able to see footage of Kobe and Jordan walking past each other in the hallway at the All-Star game. Uh, in the locker room, it was funny uh, hearing Jordan refer to Kobe as that Laker boy. Right after you say that, someone goes, who Kobe? And just watching that in 2020 with that happening in 1998, that was just like, man, if they only knew what he was about to become. It wasn't long after that when Kobe won his first championship, actually, two years after 1998. Uh, the broadcaster mentioned that people were actually dubbing Kobe as the next MJ. And it's just amazing to see how close Kobe came to MJ. You hear people say it a lot. You know, he's the closest thing to Michael Jordan that we've ever seen. He mirrors Michael Jordan's game. When you say who's the closest to Jordan, people automatically go Kobe. So it was, it was nice that they put Kobe Bryant in the uh, documentary, uh, five minutes, just, you know, it was just a complete highlight. And in this documentary, Kobe mentioned that, you know, Jordan provided a lot of guidance for him. His game wouldn't be his game if it wasn't for Jordan. He doesn't get five titles if it wasn't for Jordan. Kobe's time, like I said, lasted about five minutes, but it was more than enough time for people that loved him and still love him to this day. Still enough, you know, enough time for us to get emotional because, like I said, it was just four short months ago when he passed. And it was just watching him. It, it was just a tough one. It was really tough to see that. But I'm glad Kobe was part of this documentary. I just wish he'd gotten a chance to see the entire series like the rest of us. So they covered the uh, 1992 Dream Team and how Mike just launched into just this big global icon back in the early 90s after he won, I believe, his second championship. You know, it just put into perspective just how popular Jordan was. It also talked about what was going on with Isaiah being left off the Dream Team. Mike probably wasn't the only person who had a problem with Isaiah Thomas, but for those who try and act like Jordan wasn't the driving force, cut it out. And I mean, the driving force of Isaiah Thomas being left off the team. Come on. He had the final word. I'm pretty sure if Bird said he didn't want Thomas, but Mike said, I do want Thomas on the team. I'm pretty sure MJ would have gotten his way over Larry Bird, if we're being honest. I mean, I can't completely fault Jordan for for this because you have to think about the all-star game early on in Michael Jordan's career and I'm sure Jordan never forgot about that you know it was the freeze out they refused to pass the ball to Michael Jordan and that group was led by Isaiah, Isaiah Thomas they were not willing to pass MJ the ball because you know rumors were that they were jealous of all the attention that he was getting yeah of course Jordan wasn't the only one who probably had a problem with with Isaiah Thomas but he was the driving force he had final say on that refusing to shake the Bulls hands after Detroit fell to them in 1991 you know like I said there was no reason for the Pistons not to shake their hands 
And as a leader and the best player, Isaiah should have known better. Like, come on, your team just beat MJ three years in a row. Three consecutive years. You guys won. Meaning the third time was not the charm, and it took the Bulls the fourth try to finally get the job done. And as a vet, as a leader, as a man on the team, you have to give that man his props for finally getting over. Isaiah is to blame for that for sure. Don't put it off on your teammate. It was one of the teammates they said it was his idea. But as a leader, you have to say, nah, we're going to shake his hand. We just beat this guy three years in a row. He finally got one. You have to shake his hand. So I'm with them. I'm with everyone on that. Isaiah should have shaken his hand. Episode six covered a book called The Jordan Rule, and it talked about the things that were going on behind the scenes in the organization. Uh, This book was published in 92. And back then, you know, without social media, you got to think that, you know, I'm just thinking like a lot of people were probably clamoring for this information, you know, watching the news, hearing people review this book and just talk about it. This was stuff that this was juicy gossip for them. Today, a lot of this stuff, you know, I'm sure back then things were leaked to the media, but today it feels like it's just so much easier to get access to. And the Bulls would still go on to win a third title before Jordan left the game for the first time. Episode 7 talked about and covered Michael Jordan's father's death. And they would also go on to talk about this later in the series, but Steve Kerr's father was actually killed too. And it was an unfortunate thing he and MJ actually had in common. And he said the two of them never talked about it. But it made me think, you know, that's probably why Steve Kerr just... I think that's why Kerr played with such an edge because of what happened to his father. Uh, One of those things that I never knew. I believe I probably heard it before, but I never just really paid close attention to it. But watching this documentary, I just paid close attention to a lot of stuff. But like I said, you know, this documentary put a lot into perspective. It showed a lot that a lot of us never knew and just all around great stuff. So MJ retired after the first three peed and went on to play baseball. Episode 8 covered his return to basketball. He missed the entire 93-94 season, but he returned with 17 games remaining in uh, the 94-95 season, and the Bulls were the 5 seed that year. Uh, 93-94, they went 55-27. Really good team. Made it all the way to the second round against um, the Knicks, but ended up losing in 7. They won 55 games. That's 2 less than they had the year prior before Jordan left but they really struggled in in 94 and 95 94 95 season like I said they were the five seed lost to the magic in the second round I believe they posted a maybe a 47 win season 47 wins I'm not too sure on that but they really struggled to even get into the playoffs so even with you look at Jordan So even with this guy gone for nearly two years, he still comes back and win a first round series. You know, for some people that may be a small thing, but it's a huge deal to me. Like I said, they lost to Orlando, but it makes me wonder on what could have been. Like what if MJ never left? Hakeem was in the same draft as Jordan. In fact, he was taken first overall and MJ was taken third. Right after the dream was a guy named Sam Bowie, a guy who will never be forgotten for that reason only because he was drafted right before Michael Jordan and Boyd was gone from Portland before Jordan could get his revenge on him when you think about it in the 92 finals and I say revenge because if you follow this thing closely you know that MJ used anything and I mean anything as motivation the dude even made up stuff just to motivate himself to go out and take an opponent out He used the fact that even though this wasn't made up, he used the fact that Clyde Drexler was MVP that season. He thought it was an insult that Clyde was mentioned in the same breath as him. And I believe in that game, that game, the game one of that finals, he hit like six three pointers in the first half. But if Boy was on that team, uh, I forgot how many games Chicago won in. It was five or six. And if Boy was on that team, probably would have definitely been a sweep because like I said this is a guy that was taken right before MJ and you gotta know that he would have used that to get an edge to get an edge 
but back to my point. What if Mike had never left after the first three P? Would he have made Hakeem pay for being the first overall pick? Hakeem won back-to-back -back finals when Jordan was gone. But if Jordan never left and we get the matchup between Hakeem, Elijah Wam, and Michael Jordan, what would have happened? I'm just curious about that one. I feel like that's the only blemish on MJ's resume. He wasn't taken first overall. And that would have been a big, big topic of discussion had he ever matched up with the dream. So episode eight covered the Bulls return to the top after a semifinals loss to Orlando in 95. The Bulls won a record 72 games that season and defeated the Sonics in the uh, NBA finals in six games. Episode 9 covered the Bulls' toughest challenges. You had the Pacers and you had the Jazz. Also talked about how Steve Kerr made his mark and everything like that. You know, he and Jordan having a scuffle. Jordan eventually coming around to respect and trust him. Kerr made a lot of big shots. Uh, episode 10 talked about the last dance. The Bulls defeated the Jazz in 98 and won their sixth and final championship reflected on these things and the end of their dynasty and it just left a lot of questions on you know what could have been had they never broke up who to blame did Phil you know you even they didn't talk about this in the documentary but they but I hear people say did Phil already have a handshake agreement with the Lakers to become their coach because in the documentary the owner said that he basically you know asked Phil if he wanted to come back Phil didn't come back and people do question if he already had an agreement with the Lakers to just coach them he was already fed up with what was going on in Chicago with Jerry Krause and he was going to leave anyway so Rodman went on to play for the Lakers for a year played for the Mavs in 2000 and that was the last time he played in the NBA Pippen played for Houston following the last dance and he went on and his, you know, hi the highlight of Pippen's post bull career, Bulls career was nearly helping the Blazers beat the Lakers in 2000 in the game seven of the Western Conference Finals. You know, that was a game I went back and watched not too long ago and what I took from it was the Lakers stole one. That was a game that Portland probably should have won, but they just let get away and the Lakers were lucky to escape that game. Uh, Scotty spent four years with Portland before returning to Chicago in 04. You know, nothing eventful there, but that was the last time Pippen played in the uh, NBA. Steve Kerr went on to play for San Antonio the following year after the last dance, and that was his fourth straight championship win. The Spurs won the title in the uh, 50 game shortened lockout season. Kerr went on to win a fifth championship in 03 with the Spurs, and he finally retired after that. Then I believe he went on to be a consultant for the uh, Suns. He did some broadcasting for TNT, but of course his biggest post-playing move he made was taking that job for the Warriors in 2014. Steve Kerr won with that one. Uh, we're going to talk about Phil Jackson, but you know Phil at this time, at this point in 2014, he was the president of uh, basketball operations with the Knicks and he was looking for a coach and Steve Kerr was a guy he had in mind but the Warriors also wanted Kerr as well and with everything just terrible in New York going on I'm pretty sure it wasn't hard for Kerr to make the decision to go to Golden State come to Oakland instead of New York I'm sure he took an interview with Phil, heard him out because of the respect that he had for him. You know, just, he coached Kerr. So I'm sure he took an interview out of respect, but taking the Warriors job was, of course, a no-brainer. So Phil took a year off after the last dance, and he came back to coach the Lakers to three straight titles. Of course, he would go on to win two more and just, you know, had an entire second career in L.A., pretty much. These guys had three three-peats in his career in a back-to-back. -back. Bill Jackson, you know, you can say he lucked up into these jobs, but you call it what you want. You can say that he really wasn't a great coach. He had two great players or three great players, four. 
you know, and a lot of hardworking guys. You had Shaq, Kobe, Pippen, Jordan. But hey, you can say he was given those opportunities, but he made the most of it. He still won. And the guys who were before him did not get the job done, but he came in there and he won. And as for Michael Jordan, well, he left basketball for a year, came back, but not as a player. He became the president of basketball operations with the Wizards, Washington. Uh, things weren't working out in the front office. And I'm assuming Wizard fans, you know, of course, they were more interested in Jordan playing for them rather than sitting, you know, in the front office behind the desk and everything. So Jordan came out of retirement again and played two seasons for the Wizards. Team went 37 and 45 in both those seasons, and he officially retired from basketball for good. Uh, the only thing that sucks to me about that is that he didn't stick around for one more season. And the reason I say that is because Jordan retired and the very next year, LeBron James came into the league. You know, we got some face-offs with Jordan and Kobe, with Jordan pretty much at the end of the road, but it would have been cool to have a poster or that image of that, just that one game of Jordan and LeBron James. So it just sucks that he didn't stick around for that one last season to go up against LeBron James. I would have loved to have seen that and just look back on that. Uh, Jordan went on to buy the Charlotte Hornets and, you know, things pretty much ain't been right there ever since. You know, they've been to the playoffs a few times, never made it out of the first round. A lot of bad draft picks, owned the worst win percentage in a single season, had a 7-59 record in the lockout season in 2011. All in all, you know, not much success as an owner, but he is living a lot of players' dreams. Former player, now owner. Can't knock him for that. He do own a team. I recently heard that he said that he's definitely interested in getting more rings. And as an owner of the Charlotte Hornets, I don't know how that's going to happen, but maybe he'll come out of retirement again and play for the Lakers. Or not. Big takeaway from this series, Jordan was great. The Bulls were a very dominant team in the 90s. And the team that has come, you know, the closest to that success since are the Lakers and the Warriors. And the Lakers, ironically, had the guy that mirrored Michael Jordan the most. You know, we talked about Kobe earlier. And before I move on, I just, you know, I just want to I just want to know what you guys think about this. You know, what if. You know, Jordan said to Kobe in the All-Star game. I'll see you down the road. And that almost happened in 98. You know, Lakers finished that season 61 and 21. Kobe was still coming off the bench. He wasn't who he eventually, you know, became. And, you know, the Western Conference Finals, which the Lakers made in 98, you know, it wasn't close. Utah swept that series. But what if the Lakers had won? I don't think the Lakers would have beaten the Bulls, but it would have been super, super interesting and crazy to see that early of a matchup between Jordan and Kobe. Would Kobe and Shaq have beaten the Bulls in 2000? If, you know, the Bulls had stayed intact at least two more years? You know, they were very exhausted by that point, but would Jordan have prevented Duncan from getting that first ring? Kobe and Shaq? would have sent Jordan into retirement. That would have been a great passing of the torch moment to see Kobe win his first ring against the Bulls with Michael Jordan on the team. Just a thought. So after the Bulls finally beat Detroit, they went on to win six championships. From the time they beat the Lakers in 91, you know, we talking about the two years Jordan took off and all the way to the last dance. From that time, 91 to 98, the franchise had 26 playoff series wins. Since the title in 98, just to put it in perspective, life for Bull fans not been too kind to them. And I'm not saying that to mock them. I truly feel bad for them. The team has made the playoffs 10 times 
since 98, only have five playoff series wins. Immediately after they broke up, they went from 62 wins in the last championship season. The following season, 13 wins. That's going from riches to rags right there. You know, we always hear rags to riches, but I'll have to look up how many teams have gone from a championship, 62 wins, and then, of course, they had like a 69. Yeah, they won 69. The team actually won 69 games the year before the 62, and the 72 wins in 96. So they went from 72 wins to 69 wins to 62 wins to 13. That total may have been higher, you know, had it not been for the lockout season, if I'm being fair. You know, like I said, it was only 50 games in 99. But the point is, they were a really bad team. I talked about it earlier. Steve Kerr left. Scottie Pippen. Dennis Rodman. The coach, Phil Jackson. And the greatest player in franchise history, Michael Jordan. The Bulls' best season since 98 came in 2011. They drafted Derrick Rose with the first pick in 2008. In that season, in 08, they went 41 and 41. And they played in, you know, they played in the greatest playoff series I think I've ever seen. And they played the Celtics in that series. So KG was injured and he missed the entire playoffs. And Rondo stepped up in a big way in that series. But Rose, Rose didn't just sit back and just, you know, let Rondo just outshine him. Despite not having KG, the Bulls were still heavy underdogs against Boston. Boston's just coming off that championship season in 08. And the Bulls were still an up and coming team. You know, they were the seventh seed. I think they were the seventh seed. Uh, they may have been the first. You know, Cleveland was the first seed. Boston was two so yeah so Chicago would have been seven but they shocked a lot of people with their performance against the Celtics they won game one and Rose dropped 36 points in his playoff debut they trailed 2-1 you know after three games in that series Rose wasn't good in those losses but he bounced back in game three and scored 23 points had 11 rebounds nine assists and a double overtime win game six the Bulls were facing elimination Rose scored 28 points, grabbed eight rebounds, seven assists, and Ray Allen scored 51 points in that game. But despite that, the Bulls still pulled it out in triple overtime, force a game seven. Ended up losing game seven, but, you know, seeing Rose shine like that as a rookie against a team like the Celtics, the future was looking real good for Chicago. And I wasn't in the city. I didn't talk to any of my family members or relatives that lived there, but and who's, who will root for the Bulls, but I know that they were pretty, you know, thinking, hey, we got something here because it had been a long time since they'd seen something like this. In 2010, they stayed the same in terms of their record, 41 and 41, lost to the Cavs in five games. And then they made a huge leap in 2011. Team went 62 and 20, best record in the NBA, Rose won MVP, and the team made it all the way to the Eastern Conference Finals. They lost in five games, but like I said, this is a huge step. Rose was only drafted three years prior to this, and they were already in the Eastern Conference Finals. Rose was the first Bulls MVP since Michael Jordan. The team made it to the Eastern Conference Finals for the first time since the last dance. Bulls went on to have the best record again in the regular season, and in a lot of people's eyes, not mine, this was going to be the year that they finally beat. You know, I, I say finally, like, they played the Heat like three, four times before this, but they only played them once. But this was going to be the year they beat Miami. And then came the first round against Philadelphia. Late in that game, Rose had the ball. He drove to the basket, came down awkwardly on his uh, leg. And later it was revealed that he had torn his ACL. And honestly, the team never really got back to dominance after that. You know, they were eliminated in the first round. After Rose went down, Philadelphia beat them. And just, you know, every season after that, they were never really the same. Rose was never really the same. Went from being an MVP to now just a utility player. 
and a guy like that, you know, you hear a lot of good things about Rose, so you really feel bad for a dude like that. He's played for four teams since then. I believe he's currently now in uh, Detroit. Not washed up, but definitely not the same guy. He can still contribute. He can still go out there. You know, I think he he was in Minnesota last year. He had a 50-point game, which was an emotional night. It was good to see that because we hadn't seen that role since Chicago. Of course, we knew it wasn't going to be something that he was going to do on a consistent basis, but to see him go through everything he went through after being so high up, it was good to see him get that 50 point moment. You know, just like, just like RG3, RG3 had one great season. Rose, you know, Rose had a, a good year, you know, the year after the MVP year, but I, I see, I see similarities with RG3, 2012 RG3 rookie of the year, took Washington to the playoffs. It was the first time since 07 that the franchise went to the playoffs. He got hurt in that playoff game, and RG3 was never the same after his rookie year. He was never the same. Like I said, I know Rose went on to have a great, a good 20, uh, 2012 season, but he was never the same after that. And, you know, he and Westbrook, he and Russell Westbrook came into the league in 2008, but for me, Rose was really the first guy I, I've ever seen to give it 100% every game and had that drive where he never cheated the game. Russ is best known for that, but I think I noticed it from Derrick Rose before I noticed it from Russell Westbrook. He was no Michael Jordan, but definitely the biggest star, the biggest, yeah, the biggest star in the franchise since MJ. They had Jimmy Butler for a short while, but he had his issues with management. He he wasn't gone too long after Rose had left. Uh, in LeBron's first year back in Cleveland, the Bulls were able to take a 2-1 series lead over the Cavs in the second round. And that was the biggest success that Butler had with the Bulls. A 2-1 series lead in the second round. Cleveland went on to win that series. And LeBron just turned out to just be a thorn in the side of the Bulls. That's just the story of that. They lost in the playoffs to him four times. And that just remind me, you know, I talk about what a lot of things remind me of. And that remind me of the Rockets Warriors rivalry that wasn't really a rivalry because one team, meaning Houston, never won. But for the most part, Chicago always got, it seemed like they always got the better of LeBron in the regular season. You know, you see them play these primetime games on TNT, on, you know, ABC Sunday, or an ESPN game and the Bulls for the most part will win but that never really translated when it mattered the most in the playoffs Houston you look at it since the Warriors became the Warriors that's how I use it and when they became the Warriors in 2014 Houston is known as the team that just always had the Warriors number in the regular season but always fell short four times to be exact in the playoffs the Rockets have lost to the Warriors four times in the last five years. And that's what the Bulls playing LeBron reminded me of. The team has had eight coaches since the last dance. And just like Rose was no Jordan, Tom Thibodeau was no Phil Jackson. But he was the best coach franchise history. I mean, the best coach in the franchise since Phil Jackson. Led the team to some success. But that injury to Rose makes me think they leave a championship behind were they ever going to beat Miami or wh whatever team LeBron was on in the East because when you look at the Bulls now I don't really see an upside you know their biggest star now is Zach Levine but people only seem interested in him whenever the dunk contest come around that's what he is the fans did get that you know championship in another sport the Cubs broke that 108 year drought back in 2016 but 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 to be fair the White Sox did win it in 2005 but I'm pretty sure Cubs winning it will always be the most memorable one for people in Chicago Bears haven't won since 85 and that was like Jordan's second season Blackhawks won three championships since the Bulls last dance but I'm sure Chicago is ready for the Bulls to give them that as well but looking at the franchise now they are far 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 from that I see no upside there 
and that has been life in Chicago since the last dance. You know, really one good year. I wouldn't count the year Rose got injured because that just detracts from everything, him getting injured. 2011 was definitely the highlight and it brought back hope, but just like that, it was snatched just as fast. So that's it for the Bulls and that's it for me. Thank you guys for listening. Be sure to hit that thumbs up, leave a comment, and subscribe. Until next time, take care.